it, it's just <laughs> in terms of so Moses Hogan was a guy who, when I was 13, he was a senior in high school at this, the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. He got a full scholarship to Oberlin. So everybody said, man, Moses got a scholarship to Oberlin. Moses really could play piano. And he ended up having a group called the Moses Hogan uh, Singers or the Chorale. And he, he redefined the Negro spiritual in his time. He, he did unbelievable things with his ensemble. And even still, one of his arrangement of Didn't My Lord Deliver Daniel is the definitive arrangement sung by choirs all over the world. So he was a senior in high school playing piano. Then there was a guy after him two years named Kent Jordan. He played flute and he got a full scholarship to Eastman. So, you know, even though we were country, it was like, man, Kent. And Kent was a guy who made me start practicing because I was always playing basketball and clowning around and playing and he was playing flute and I was teasing him because he played flute. Man, you a dude playing flute. Who ever heard of this kind of stuff? You know, and he said, man, I'll, I'll take you out on the court and whip you behind. Well, I was, I was like, man, I play ball. I'm not like a musician. You know, he came out there and actually was credible with his game. I thought, hey, if a guy can have a credible game playing flute, I need to start practicing. So I started, I started, I mean, you know, that was back in those times. Now, of course, I've been trained out of saying that kind of stuff. But back then, okay, I'm, I'm reminiscing. Then you didn't see a lot of men playing flute. And then, um, then I said, well, Kent got a scholarship to Eastman. I, I'm going to get a scholarship to Juilliard, you know? So we were kind of competitive with each other. And uh, so that's what the whole genesis of the thinking was. And then after me, the actor, Wendell Pierce, went to the same high school. He also got a scholarship to Juilliard in theater. So we had a tradition going in the school. It has spanned the whole kind of decade, spanned from like 70, 76 to 84, 85, something like that. It's incredible. And, and it's extraordinary how you know, at such a young age, the the landscape of your musical attention, I think, you know, the listening and the attention and the, the, the I mean, clearly you are like a sponge. You still remember the teacher's names and, and how they influenced you. I, I mean, that's quite extraordinary. And I wonder whether the music establishments are uh, beginning now to open up this kind of uh, lateral listening, as it were, uh, in, in a student's life? You know, I, I don't, different academies are different, different teachers are different. Mm. Like I was lucky to be in that high school at that time. And the, each teacher teaches in different ways based on what they know. And mm. from a philosophical standpoint, philosophy itself means a broader view. Mm. So some people's view aperture is open and some are not. If you're lucky to have really fantastic teachers, they teach you out of a prejudiced tribal viewpoint. If not, they teach you a dogma. And, uh, you know, the, the whole kind of Socratic method of teaching was the way they taught more. So many questions. For me, it was just fortunate to be with them and to be around them. And uh, I remember at that high school, a, a group came from Africa of dancers, a guy named Ishangi. And they gave a class. And our, our classes went from 1.30 or 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So if you were a student at that school, you went to your regular academic school from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And then you were in the school from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So <laughs> your school day was substantial. Mm. We stayed in the assembly of the school with this guy and his dancers till 7 o'clock, asking him questions and I remember the worldview he had was so different from our worldview and just like the sophistication of what they were doing. Because, you know, we, in America, we were, we were taught Africans were just, you know, basically savages, didn't know anything. We didn't know any history. We're ignorant. We taught with, and I remember how my father and Bert Bro and our teachers, the questions they were asking, hey, they were the adults, man, they were asking more questions than us. They were like, well, what does this mean? Or what? And it was all about meaning. And when I saw my teachers, all very different people, my father's very different from Bert Bro, my theory teacher, very different from, but, but the enthusiasm they showed for the information about what the dance meant, the different orbits of the male and female orbit of the rhythm, the three rhythm, the six rhythm, the four rhythm, all the things they were talking about, how, what rituals mean, how you give meaning to a rhythm, oh, all this. And I thought, man, it's, it's fascinating to see them more interested in learning about this than us. We need to be more interested in the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's more uh, affected me. And as it was at a young age. So as I went through life, 
I didn't, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't taught to think that whatever I knew defined the world and to know that whatever I knew defined the world of what I knew. And that wasn't that much. <laughs> My mama used to always say, you just another person out here, but she didn't use the word person. She used a colloquial term. You just another person out here, you know. 